Welcome to Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom. The best the king has to offer. Today's topic is the laws of the kingdom. Every kingdom has a constitution, the documented will, purposes, and intent of the king. The rule of the kingdom of heaven is about government. The ruler of the kingdom is God, the one who governs. And the kingdom of heaven rules over every earthly kingdom. This is why Jesus told his disciples to pray according to Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In every civil society of the world, including kingdoms, rule or government is the basis of order and social justice. In a democratic republic, a constitution is the documented aspirations, desires, and hopes of the people for themselves. We call it government by the people for the people. In like manner, in a kingdom, the king's aspirations and desires for his citizens are documented in a constitution as well. The king's expressed will in written form. In every country of the world, laws are enacted to protect the Constitution and to secure the right of the citizens to what the Constitution promises and guarantees them. Rules and regulations are necessary not only to provide public safety and preserve moral order, but also to keep the bestial instincts of man in check. In the kingdom of heaven, the Constitution is a royal contract of God's will purposes, and intent expressed by God through his holy apostles and prophets and contained in what we call the Holy Bible. Apostle Peter tells us about the certainty of scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 19 through 21, he says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Holy Scripture is not of private origin. It has been revealed by God to holy men who interpreted and recorded it. Therefore, according to this rule or principle, we are not permitted to interpret the scriptures to suit our personal preferences. The Holy Bible is God's royal contract or constitution which contains his will, purposes, and intent for mankind on earth since God reigns as king of kings. He is the king over all earthly kingdoms and has given his rule to all that will accept his son Jesus as Savior and Lord. When born-again believers prioritize living according to the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, though we live on earth, we live the life of heaven on earth. So life in the kingdom is really about adhering to the governing authority of God and learning how to live and function in that authority here on earth. God's kingdom constitution is really a covenant between God and his people. It is unique because God alone sets the conditions. God sets the requirements, and each person decides whether to agree to them and enter the covenant. The covenant God offers requires obedience and loyalty to him alone. For those who agree to this, God gives his protective care, his assurance, his guidance, and his presence. The Bible, the kingdom of heaven's constitution, establishes the standards for life in the kingdom. But unlike other constitutions, it also lays out the penalties for non-compliance. So in addition to being a constitution, the Bible is also the law book of the kingdom of heaven. And for the believer, the benefits of the covenant, constitution, law of the kingdom, far outweigh the costs. We often think of laws as unpleasant and inconvenient demands that restrict our freedom and limit our options. But in reality, laws are designed to free us to pursue unlimited options by providing a safe environment where we can live in peace with security and confidence. I like to think of kingdom laws as kingdom security 
which cannot be breached. So within those boundaries of kingdom law, we are free to thrive, prosper, and reach our full potential. Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 11, lists some of the positive benefits we derive from the laws of the kingdom. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yeah, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. This context regarding the law of the Lord demonstrates the moral nature of God's holiness. Our English word law translates to the Hebrew word Torah, which means precept or statute, guidance, teaching, or instruction. The characteristics of the law of the kingdom indicate the godliness that is intended to result from God's revelation. His work is converting. It changes and saves. His revelation is clean, cleansing the human spirit from sin. So then, the law of the Lord revives our spirit, gives us wisdom, and fills us with joy. These are just a few of the benefits we have when we adhere to the laws of the kingdom. Additionally, the law of the Lord enlightens our minds and saturates us with confidence because it is trustworthy. It enriches us with wealth much greater than earthly riches and leaves a secret taste in our mouths. It warns us against danger and foolishness that could destroy our lives and places us on the path to great reward. I love Psalm chapter 103 verses 1 through 5 because this context of scripture talks about the benefits we have as believers in covenant with God, the King. Through the King's benefits, believers are thoroughly nourished, spirit, soul, and body. Let's read what it says. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. As you can see, the benefits to those who abide in the law of the Lord, his kingdom, are all about redemption and renewal. There is no law in the Bible that is not good for humanity's overall welfare. The fact is that the laws of the kingdom, as expressed in the Bible, are the best restrictor of civic violations in a society. So the problem is not the law as expressed in the Bible. It is the fact that societies all over the world reject the wisdom of the Bible, which is the law of the kingdom, and insist on choosing their own path. Believers, especially, need to learn to live life by design and not by default. When we obey the laws of the kingdom, we protect the purpose, the divine design for which we were born. As long as we obey the laws of God, we will live and grow and prosper. By obeying God's laws, I mean living in willing submission to him as king and lord and honoring his word as the changing standard of reference for our lives. There are many laws or principles of the kingdom of heaven. All of them we are to obey. But Jesus speaks of the two most important laws of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
Jesus himself identified these as the two most important commandments in the law of the kingdom. In Romans chapter 13, verse 10, Apostle Paul discusses the responsibility of kingdom citizens towards civic earthly authority. Let's read what he said. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Obey the law of the kingdom and it protects you. Disobey the law of the kingdom and you risk sacrificing your purpose. As I said earlier on this podcast, laws exist to make sure that the provisions of the Constitution are carried out consistently, equitably, and without prejudice for all citizens. In the kingdom of heaven, the laws of God are designed to protect and ensure the fulfillment of all terms of the covenant that God has with his creation. Because God's covenant with man is unilateral, meaning that we enter freely into a covenant he has already established, he alone can swear faithfulness. The constitutional covenant of the kingdom of heaven is backed by the laws of God, which are the expressions of his unshakable and unchanging word. Laws are the conditions of covenant. They are the terms under which, if followed, the covenant will operate. In the kingdom of heaven, The king's covenant with us specifies blessings and benefits for compliance, as well as consequences and penalties for non-compliance. As long as we observe the conditions of the covenant, all the blessings and benefits of the covenant are operative in our lives. If we violate the covenant, the blessing clause shuts down and the consequences clause kicks in. The kingdom of heaven is like any other government in the sense that it has laws to protect it and assure that it operates according to God's plans and purposes. God's kingdom is established upon laws. When we violate the law, we receive the due penalty. God doesn't have to judge us. The law carries its own built-in judgment and penalty. Remember, the king's word is law in his kingdom. When the law is written down, it is called a testament. And when it is repeated verbally, it constitutes a commandment. At this point, I want to define two Greek words used in the New Testament for law. The first is namos, which means a principle. It means to divide out or distribute and assign, hence usage, custom, and eventually law. Law as prescribed by custom or by statute. The second Greek word for law in the New Testament is ethos, which means custom, manner, or habit. For citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the Bible is the namos, the decreed established law of the kingdom that we are pledged and obligated to obey. The Bible is not a religious book. It is a legal book, a book of laws that God has established and set forth in written form to define and protect this kingdom, as well as to protect, preserve, and deliver the entire community of mankind. Whenever we speak of something as being customary, we're speaking of ethos as law. God's laws are supposed to be customary for us. It is supposed to be customary for us not to lie or not to steal, not to covet. It's supposed to be customary for us to forgive and to love our enemies as well as each other. Ethos is less formal than namos. In fact, whereas namos came to mean decreed, established law, ethos was used to describe unwritten law. The laws of the kingdom of God have personal application with national ramifications. God's laws are designed to prevent us from accepting and normalizing evil and assigning it the force of law in our society. The most powerful laws of all are the unwritten laws. In any culture, customs generally carry the social force of law, even without formal legal establishment. And customs quite often have a greater influence on people's behavior than any formal laws that are on the books. God never intended to write down any of his laws for us. His intention always was to write his laws on our hearts and in our minds so that no one would have to teach us. 
This is why the first covenant, the law of Moses in the Old Testament, had to be replaced with the new covenant, which came through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Let's take a look at this transition in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins, and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. It was humanity's rebellion and separation from God that made written law necessary. Mankind needed something to restrain his nature and instincts and prevent him from destroying himself by uncontrolled selfishness, passion, and violence. The king's goal has never changed. Despite mankind's rebellion, his original purpose still stands. This unchanging purpose of the king was fulfilled in the new covenant through Jesus Christ. So God intended law to be natural or inherent. There is a difference between natural law and written law. Written law is necessary only when natural law is absent. In other words, if people were all law-abiding by nature, there would be no need for written law. The purpose for written law is to restore natural law to the conscious mind. Man's rebellion against God calls him to lose his instinctive knowledge and understanding of natural law. His conscience became corrupt and his likeness to the Creator became tarnished and distorted. In other words, things that were natural in the beginning now became unnatural. God intended law to be natural. Natural law is sometimes referred to as the spirit of the law. This reflects God's desire for his laws, the standards of his kingdom, to become the norms of our society. Earth is really a community of immigrants from heaven, since we were already living in God and seated together with him in the heavenly places before the foundation of the world. So the laws of the kingdom of heaven apply to us on earth as much as they do in heaven. We are foreigners and sojourners here on earth. Let's back this up with several texts of scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 6. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 18 and 19. And 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. 
Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Yes, there's a difference between the law and the spirit of the law, which refers to original intent, the purpose that was in the mind of God from the beginning. Therefore, the spirit of the law is the inherent essence of the original purpose and intent of that law. As such, the spirit of the law is always higher and broader than the letter of the law, the written. From the Amplified Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, It is he who has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers of a new covenant of salvation through Christ, not ministers of the letter of legally written code, but of the spirit for the code of the law kills, but the Holy Spirit makes alive. I like that. So, the greatest form of law is unwritten law. Unwritten law is a product of the spirit of the law. When law has to be written, it is because the people are disobedient. Written law is a sign that the people have lost sight of the spirit of the law, the original intent. So, where the spirit of the law is, there is no need for written law. This is why it is so important for those of us who are kingdom citizens to regain our understanding of the spirit of the law, natural law, inherent law. Natural law is the fundamental operating principle of the kingdom of heaven. The laws of the kingdom protect and preserve not only God's kingdom, but also the benefits and privileges of the kingdom that are reserved for kingdom citizens. Embrace the laws of the kingdom and receive the benefits and privileges of the kingdom reserved for kingdom citizens. The best the king has to offer. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. I hope you join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.